All right, so this lesson is the, uh, the Kingdom Parables. This is lesson number six in that series. The title is The Parable of the Sower and the Seed will be in Matthew chapter 13. So when I began this series on the Kingdom Parables, I told you that there were 13 of Jesus' parables where He is describing the Kingdom. Of these uh, 13 Kingdom Parables, um, uh, some were about cooking, uh, the kingdom was like leaven, for example, that began small but had great visible influence. Uh, others were about uh, fishing. The kingdom was like a net that captured many fish, which were then separated. Uh, the kingdom was, about, was like, um, uh, like feasts. Uh, in one, the kingdom was like a wedding feast where you needed to be properly attired to remain. And then also the kingdom was like a wedding ceremony where you needed to be ready so that you could get into the ceremony and not be left behind. And then somewhere about money, the kingdom was like a pearl or a treasure that you would give everything up in order to possess. The kingdom was like a person who enables his employees to invest his money and then rewards the ones who do so faithfully and profitably. And then there was the one uh, where Jesus says the kingdom was like a king who was prepared to forgive a great debt to one of his servants if that servant would show the same type of mercy to others. So those are the, you know, the ones that we've done so far. In our lesson today, we're going to start the final series of parables on the kingdom, the five parables that use agriculture as a base for their stories, and therein uh, we, that's why we're at the parable of the sower and the seed. Now, they often refer to this parable as the parable of the soils, because it is not really about the sower and it's not really about the seed. It's really about the different kinds of soil that the sower puts his seed into. This parable appears in Matthew 13, also in Mark chapter four, verses one to 12, and in Luke chapter eight, verses four to 10. We're not going to do all three versions of it. We will do the one that is in Matthew, which pretty, you know, it's comprehensive. It, it gives us all that information that we need to study this uh, parable. And the parable has three sections to it. The first section is the parable itself, the story itself. The, other, the next part is an explanation of why Jesus used this style of teaching, or in other words, why did He use parables? An explanation from Jesus Himself. So far, I've explained to you, you know, why Jesus used them. Today, we're going to actually look at the explanation that Jesus gives, and then an explanation of the parable itself. So this is not a, uh, you know, this is not a personality or a story driven parable. It is based on a common observation that any person could make then as well as now. The beauty of it is <laughs> you could be living in the year 2000, you could be living in the year 3000. It's the same story, so, so generic is it. Uh, so the parable itself, uh, uh, let's understand something that's taking place ahead of time before the parable because that helps us to understand the context. So in chapter 12, verses 46 to 50, we read about uh, the family of Jesus trying to get him to go home with them. You know, they're starting to say, you know, this guy is crazy. You know, there's a, he's causing trouble. There's all kinds of turmoil around him. So his family naturally, they go to him and, and, and say, you, know, we, we, you need to come home and you need to rest. And so the next chapter, chapter 13, continues the story with what happened after he went home. And so in chapter 13, verse one, we begin, that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. So the Lord apparently, you know, it doesn't tell you in chapter 12 that He did go home, because in chapter 12 He says, well, who, who's my brother, who's my sister, right? 
the ones that you know, obey the word of the Lord. Those are my brothers and sisters. And then it just stops there, it doesn't tell us. And so therefore he went home with them to appease his mom, to calm everybody's nerve. And his family it doesn't say that. It just picks up the story that he's at home now in verse one, chapter 13. So um, on that same day, he returns outside and he goes to the water's edge. All right, so let's read verse two. It says, and large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And so because he's crowded in, he uses the boat to you know, push away from the shore, and he's going to use the boat like a floating stage. Uh, and he also uses it to sit down, because in those days the teachers sat in order to teach their students, unlike today in most lecture halls or churches, the teacher is standing in order to do that work. Also, it's pretty hard to teach people when they're right in front of you, you know, when they're like two or three feet and they're, they're pushing in and pressing on, on top of you, so that's the reason uh, for the boat itself. Uh, verse three says, and he spoke many things to them in parables. So at this point he begins to tell them a parable and as far as we know this parable was the first one spoken by the Lord during His ministry. So if, you've ever, if you've ever wondered, which is the first parable? Well, scholars believe this is the very first one that He spoke. And then we read the parable itself. He says, behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil, but when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out, and others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So the story is simple enough. A sower, a farmer, goes out to sow wheat or barley, usually sown by hand in Palestine in those days. The patch of land is not necessarily large. It has no fences and has a road either running alongside of it or running through the middle of it, dividing it in some way. Some of the seeds fall on the pathway and are eagerly eaten up by the birds. Not done on purpose, of course, simply seed that lands there while you know, you're throwing seed out. Some will you know, kind of if you're close to the pathway, some of those seeds will fall on the pathway. Um, much of Palestine or much of that area is rocky and uh, so much of the tilled soil has spots where uh, the rock is barely covered by the earth. So the heat of the rocks provide a good temperature for the soil to germinate the seed, but the soil doesn't contain enough moisture to keep it alive in the hot sun. This is why plants take and grow quickly, but they don't last in that, kind of, in that area, in that type of soil. Uh, much of the soil has thorns, weeds, which are cut, but soon grow back with the crop and choke its growth. And then on the good soil, that soil which has depth and moisture, properly weeded, the seed is sown and it produces a harvest. Like any harvest, each grain sown produces a variety of yield. That's why he said some 30, some 60. It's not a judgment call, it's just how it is. You know? um, however, uh, the, good, the, the, the seed that falls on the good soil, whether it produces 30, 60, or 100, nevertheless, there's a harvest. In verse nine, he continues, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. So Jesus tells his hearers that this simple story has a special meaning, and if they try to understand, they may just grasp what he's trying to say to them. Verse 10, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Now in Mark, chapter 4, 10, Mark says that his followers, along with the apostles, came to him for an explanation of the parable along with the reason why he taught this way. Why are you teaching this way? One of the reasons why we believe this is the first 
time that he's kind of given a parable. It isn't that Jesus invented parables, you know, other writers, it was a literary form, it was a story form that was used by others, and they're wondering, why are you, why are you doing this? You were teaching openly before, now you're, you're using this device. Now if anyone tried to understand the parable, they would realize that they couldn't understand the parable without some help. So the people who came to him were those who were listening and hearing and searching for the answers and Jesus is not going to disappoint them. But first he's going to explain the reason why he will teach in parables. And as I say, the fact that the question arose suggests that this was one of the first time he used this device. So this will help the hearers understand not only this parable, but all the other parables that he will eventually teach. So the reason for the parable, so he's given the parable, the apostles and disciples come and ask him to explain it to them, and why do you teach this way? Then in verses 11 to 17, he gives them the answer to their first question, why does he teach this way? And he does so for a variety of reasons. First, the knowledge of the kingdom is a blessing. You know, God is the one who reveals the mysteries of His thoughts and His intentions. And through the parables, He can hide the meaning and the knowledge of the kingdom from those He doesn't wish to have them. He doesn't want the ones who are meaning to harm Jesus or to destroy His ministry, He doesn't want to give them more ammunition than they already have. And He doesn't want to give, you know, that, you know, He doesn't want to give the pearl to who? Well, to the swine, usually meaning unbelievers, pagans. So in verse 11, Jesus answered them, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. I, you know, I've often struggled with the idea, you know, does, does God play, you know, because God doesn't play favorites, right? God doesn't play favorites, but when it explains that about God, it also explains the idea that He does favor those who love Him and who obey Him. So He doesn't play favorites with those who come to Him, who want to know something, who want to serve and obey Him, all of those people who come to Him, He will treat them equally. They will be, you know, they're, they're open to all the blessings that He has. But He plays favorites in the sense that if you're not a believer, if you're opposed to Him, well then you will not receive favored treatment. That's only in our society, we, we want to treat everybody. The bank robbers and, and the heroes, you know, we want to treat them the same way. But that's not the way it works uh, in the kingdom. So the apostles and disciples, they've been granted the privilege to understand, to penetrate the mysteries of the parable that Jesus will explain in a moment. The scribes, the Pharisees, and those who follow them along with the unbelievers, they will not be permitted to understand. And the reason for this, of course, is that they will not come to Jesus who is the only one who can explain the parables and who is the central figure or key to all the parables. If they want to understand using some other method, they just will not be able to grasp what He's teaching because you've got to believe he is who He says He is, if you want uh, insight. I, I take great comfort. You know, I, read these, I read these Psalms sometimes that, that talk about how God will take care of His own, uh, that He'll protect His own, and, and I uh, you know, sometimes extrapolate from that that God you know, will take care of everybody. And I say, well, what about those guys? And what about these guys? They're not being taken care of. Then I realize, wait a minute, He said He will take care of His own. the followers of Jesus, and there's no need to feel guilty about that. I don't feel guilty because God is blessing me richly beyond anything that I deserve personally. 
I don't feel guilty about that because the Lord has said to all those who want to follow Him, who want to believe, that He'll bless you for that. And I don't feel guilty if someone else who is not a believer, who rejects God, isn't being blessed. <laughs> I, I, I don't feel personal guilt because of that. Because God has told us. He'll reveal the mysteries. He'll open the windows of heaven. He promises eternal life. To whom? To everybody? No to those who believe and obey Him. Now we do have a responsibility, and what is that responsibility? Well, to tell other people, look, these blessings are open for you. The door of heaven is open for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Repent, be baptized, you know? That's our responsibility. So in verse 12 he goes on and says, for whoever has to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. See what I'm saying? Who are the ones that have? The believers. And who are the ones that don't have? Well, the non-believers. Those who doubt, those who reject. So those who have begun to seek Jesus and follow and listen to Him and obey Him, they will receive more knowledge, more insight, and eventually resurrection from the dead and eternal life. And those who have simply listened to the parable and rejected Christ will drift away from Him, eventually even forgetting the parable itself and ultimately becoming His enemy. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So for this reason, because some are believing and some are disbelieving, Jesus is beginning to separate the two by using parables. It's a sifting device. You know, the wheat and the tares, we always, we always have this idea, I'm generalizing here, but you know, bear with me, that the day of judgment comes and we're all standing there and, uh, and that's when the sifting is going to be done and we're there, well, I hope I'm going to make it, I hope they're going to go call my name. And some people, you know, the sheep and the goats, and they're always trying to figure out, the goats are on the left side, but is it left facing him or his left or is it my left? You know? The sifting doesn't happen after. The sifting is happening now. Now the sifting, now the fish are being separated. Now the, the believers and the unbelievers. What comes after is the judgment. That's what comes after. The judgment and the reward, not the sifting. So when you say yes to Jesus and I'll follow Lord and I'm doing the best I can Lord, please Lord help me with my weaknesses and so, you know, you're being sifted. You're being taken away and separated from those who disbelieve and those who reject and those who are unfaithful. The sifting is happening while we live. And Jesus is kind of um, alluding to this idea right here with the parables. He said, I'm already starting to sift out, not waiting till the end of the world when I return. We're going we're to separate, you know, I won't say the men from the boys, but I'm going to separate the believers from the unbelievers. I'm going to do that now. It'll be quite obvious. So for this reason, because some are believing and some are disbelieving, as I say, Jesus starts to separate the two. Their disbelief, meaning their hearing without understanding, their seeing without perceiving, will be made evident by Jesus' use of parables. Is it the only way He sifts? No. He has other ways of sifting. He says to some, come, follow me, and some do come and follow Him. And others, like the rich young ruler, mm, the cost is too high for him. And others, he says, come follow me. And one says, well, I got to go bury my father. I've got to, 
take care of my business first. They're... So some at his invitation just say no. And others at his invitation say, well, maybe later on, maybe when the time is right, maybe when I'm you know, better disposed. That's a sifting moment. So the knowledge of the kingdom is a blessing reserved for the believers and the, disbelie and the disbelievers rather are filtered out by use of the parables. And why is the, the knowledge of the kingdom a blessing? It's a blessing because we are exposed to the reality of life. It's the kingdom that's the real thing. The false thing is Hollywood. You know, I use that term gen generically there. That's the false thing. The movies, the system, the gossip, the this, the, that's, that's the world, that's the false thing. That, those are the lies. The truth is the kingdom of God, that's the truth. How is it a blessing? We're being exposed to what is true, what is real. Secondly, we're still talking about why use these. Their use was prophesied. Verse 14 and 15. It says, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return. And I would heal them. Uh, this is the prophet Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah said that the people would ultimately not believe because they had cultivated a disbelieving attitude. And it didn't happen all of a sudden. It didn't happen in the two or three years of Jesus' ministry. This was decades, centuries in the making. Generations of half-hearted worship, disobedience, rejection, and manipulation of God's word had produced a nation who were dull and unprepared spiritually for their Messiah. You know, I, I, I don't know who said it, I didn't say it, but I don't know who said it, um, but a, a, a wonderful saying that I've repeated often to my own children, um, blessed is the man who is prepared when his time comes. Jesus had prepared these people for 1,500 years. He had prepared them. And so few of them were ready when He finally arrived. It's the same thing with us. You know, the Lord visits us, if you wish, with an insight, an understanding, a challenge for service, perhaps um, a challenge uh, you know, like a trial in our life, whether it be illness or the death of a loved one or whatever. You know, we all have these challenges. Well, they're challenges, but they're also an opportunity to demonstrate what is our faith made of? You know, we're bumping along, everything's kind of grooving along, you know? and then all of a sudden the Lord takes us, whoops, dips us into the fire, whatever the fire is for you or me, then He holds us up to the light, and he examines, what kind of faith do we have here? That's, that's a visitation from God. The unbelievers, what do they see? They only see the trial. They only want the trial to be over. And when the trial is over, what do they have? Well, nothing. <laughs> Just the impact and effects of the trial, the surgery, the loss, whatever it is. But for the believer, same impact, the trial, you know, the pain, the sorrow, whatever, but there's something else. There's the knowledge that through this fire, I came through this fire and I still believe. The evil one or the evil thing that happened to me may have destroyed my body in many ways, may have even destroyed someone that I love but did not destroy my faith. That kind of real life knowledge is a tremendous blessing because it makes us so much stronger afterwards and a great comfort to know 
that you know, God is in charge. That's not just a saying you know, on a coffee cup. I mean, that's great if you remind yourself, but that's not just a cute saying on a coffee cup. That's what life is like in the kingdom of God. So what he was doing, and the reason for it was not a surprise. It wasn't a last minute thing. It was known and spoken beforehand by the prophets. If they would have been ready, meaning if they would have been ready because they understood God's word, they would have understood oh, another reason to believe that this is the Messiah. Because the prophets, our prophets, said when the Messiah comes, he's going to use this device to speak to the people. Now, was that the only proof? No. There were the miracles, there was the teaching itself, there was his life and so on and so on. But that was one proof that any of them could have known had they known and believed their own scriptures. And we say, wow, what's wrong with those guys? Man, what's their deal? If I was there, you know, I would have taken care of business. I, you know. But we have the word spoken to us, doesn't it? Don't the apostles tell us, be ready. You never know when the end will come. Uh, repent, you know, like I preached on Sunday. You know. Repent and be baptized, because you, know, you never know. And how many people put it off and put it off? And does it really say that? Should we really be baptized? You know, the, so we tend to do the very same thing as they did. And the, the, the New Testament tells us that their story, 1 Corinthians 10, I believe, that their story, the story of the Jews, was written for our benefit so that we can learn from what they did right and from what they did wrong. And then thirdly, you know, if we, I'm kind of going off on a few tangents here, but you know, reasons for the parable, the fullness of time had come. Verse 16 and 17, he says, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. They were blessed because they were living at a time when all of these things were about to be fulfilled. The patriarchs, the judges, the kings, the prophets, even the angels, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Peter says, even the angels longed to look into these things. Even the angels wanted to know what was the plan? How was it going to work itself out? And they didn't know. Only they only saw the shadows, the promises, the visions of the coming Messiah. But Jesus says they were blessed because they were living at a time when these things were actually being fulfilled and they could hear and see and touch and be taught by the Messiah Himself. You know, somebody's going to be alive when Jesus returns. What an experience that's going to be. It could be us, but we don't know. Imagine that experience. I think about that sometimes. Imagine that experience. You know, we get a little rattled when there's an earthquake here in Oklahoma, all of a sudden, bang, you know, and the, the, you know, the dishes rattle, and it kind of, you know, whoa, what was that? That was something that is very big. Can you imagine the end of the world? Jesus, how big that is? That's not a tornado, that's not, we're, we're amazed when we see the lightning flash here in Oklahoma, you know, that flat country, we see the, wow, from the top to the bottom, it's pretty spectacular stuff. But imagine the Lord returns. Imagine what you're saying to yourself. This is the end of the world. It's over. I'm going to go into another dimension. <gasps> Somebody's going to have that experience. He's saying to them, for hundreds of years, your forefathers, they, they wondered, what will it be like when the Messiah comes, when all these prophecies, uh, prophecies will be fulfilled? And lo and behold, Jesus is saying, you're the ones, you are alive at the time that all these others hoped for. You are receiving these blessings. And that's why I'm teaching in parables. Because you believe, you get to see, you have insight into what is really, really happening. 
All right, so then he goes on from 18 to 23, he's going to talk about the meaning. So he's given the parable, he's explained why he's using parables, now the meaning. Jesus describes, uh, remember I said this is not about the sower or the seed, it's really about the soil. Okay? So Jesus describes four kinds of soil that receive the seed and how the seed fares in each type of soil. We learn that the soil is a person's heart his attitude, feelings, beliefs, will. The seed is God's word of the kingdom. The sower is Jesus himself. The parable explains that a person's spiritual life or death or development is based on how that person receives God's word into their heart. So let's look at the soils the hard soil. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. So the side of the field, the pathway, the hard packed dirt, the birds come and they take the seed away even as, even as it's being sowed. Now we see this happening with people, don't we? People who are full of disbelief and cynicism and skepticism. They have the hard heart of a sinful life. The birds are all the reasons and excuses that Satan sends to prevent these people from believing. I, 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 see, I see the hard path at funerals when preaching a funeral. People are listening to the word. You're talking about everybody dies and then there's a judgment and a resurrection. And even, even though the dead body is right there in the room with all of us, cannot be denied. People are looking at their watch, they're checking their email. You know, I, tell, I tell the congregation, whether it's Marty or me or any other preacher, you know, when I'm up there preaching, you all see me, but I see you. <laughs> I also see you checking your phones, talking to each other, you know, yakking about something else, or whatever. And I see that at funerals sometimes. You know? It's like I'm throwing the word out there and I can see it just bouncing, it's just coming back to me. You know, they, they think the word is not inspired or it's all exaggeration just to frighten people. Even some preachers don't believe in it. People are saying, these are the excuses they make, the, hard heartness of their, the hardness of their hearts. Christians are hypocrites. If I believe, you know, this will interfere with my favorite pastime, which happens to be sinful. The net result is that the word produces absolutely nothing except a faint recollection that it landed on the conscious mind just for a moment before being snatched away. I mean, I've done funerals where the person who died, died of, you know, they say they died of lung disease, but what they actually died of was you know, 50 years of smoking. You know. And everybody knows it, and yet, especially when you're doing an, you know, like the burial, you know, you're out at the cemetery and there's always a little, you know, a little service there, gravesite, call it a gravesite service. And as soon as it's over, you know, everybody breaks up, you know, they got the body in the ground and, you know, and everybody lights up. <laughs> it's like, come on, people. So that's the hard soil. You know, the, the, the imagery of the birds picking up the seeds Satan picking up the seeds, giving all kinds of excuses not to believe, not to take a step, okay? The next soil is the rocky soil, verse 20. He says, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. So this uh, is uh, uh, the layer of warm soil you know, with hard rock underneath. This is the person who receives, meaning he understands, and quickly shows a lot of promise in the word. 
We know the type, enthusiastic at first, ready to join in, knows the plan, encourages other people to come to Christ. Plants need the sun and the heat to grow. In the same way, Christians need the heat of trials and struggle to grow in Christ as well. So this person being referred to here, this person's hard heart is never dealt with and not seen at first. It could be basic sinfulness, you know, pride, whatever it is. Anyways, when the word begins to force this person to deal with their issues, they immediately disappear. I remember uh, at a gospel meeting where a, where a young girl was, uh, uh, came forward uh, and requested to be baptized. And she was young, she was 15 or 16, something like that. And we felt that we needed to speak to her mother. You know, uh, she was a single mom, I think. And uh, you know, just to, to talk about this. And her mother was interested as well. And so we had some Bible studies with both of them. Um, they were both interested, but in the end, the mom refused to, you know, refused to be baptized, refused to become a Christian. And I gently prodded her a little bit, you know, is there a reason, a main reason why? Because you, you, you know, it's the craziest reasons why people won't be baptized. You know, sometimes people will hold off on being baptized because they are embarrassed to get their hair wet in front of people. Uh, sounds crazy. You know, they, they love the Lord and this and that, but they're so shy, they're so embarrassed that they, and when you tell them, well, you don't have to do that in front of people. It can just be me and you and your husband. You know, you know, we can just be your family. Oh, there's a relief there. You know. So I asked this woman, is there a reason and this and that, just to be quite honest, I have a boyfriend and I spend the weekend, every weekend with him. And I realize that if I become a Christian, that's going to have to change. And I don't want to change that. We got a good thing going and I, you know, I don't want to scare him away. And that was her reason and she stuck with it and brought her daughter with her. So yes, enthusiastic at first about heaven and forgiveness and yes, and she was among Christians who you know, acted properly and acted lovingly towards her. Yeah, I want a piece of that. That's better than my life. That's better than the people I hang around with. Yes, except when it came to giving up sin. Yeah, grew up very fast. The moment a little heat was applied, fell away very quickly. The third one, I got, I got to move here. Uh, the thorny soil and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness uh, of wealth uh, choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So here the plant dies, but the death is slow, slow death, unlike the seed in the rocky ground. It takes a while for the weeds and the thorns to completely choke the good plant. Jesus describes the thorns in this man's heart or soil as being two in particular. One, worry of the world. Each generation has its things to worry about. That's normal. This person in the parable allows these worries to overcome his life in the kingdom. Unfortunately, some people invest more of their emotional energy and concern over worldly things than concern and involvement in the kingdom. And then he talks about the deceitfulness of riches. The world and its wealth and attractions seduce a person away again from the kingdom. We talk about Demas in the New Testament. And again, he's not saying that these people are really terrible sinners, you know, thieves, murderers, adulterers. No, they're just folks. But they just let the worry of life, you know, just... And again, it doesn't say the worry of life just takes them out, you know, like just in one shot. No, eventually it just extinguishes you know, faith, like a flame. It just extinguishes it. The worry of the world, the rat race you know, to get ahead. Now many Christians, you know, they start well, but uh, at first, and then they become distracted, 
and finally pulled completely away from Christ. Why? Uh, too busy, too stressed, too involved, too many problems, too much money or too little money, too many toys, too many bad habits, too many unbelieving friends. For these people, the word has no impact, no challenge, no authority, no comfort, no inspiration anymore. And then he talks about the good soil. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The good soil, the good heart, is described as being one that, that hears and understands. It hears with the ears and the heart, understands the primary and secondary meaning of the parables, ready to believe and obey the words of Christ. So Jesus says this heart is going to produce the harvest where each seed will produce differently. You know, we're stronger in some parts of our spiritual life and service than in other parts. That's what this is talking about. It's not a judgment. Some people say, oh, I'm a 30, you know, I'm a 30-fold, I guess I'm not good enough. No, it's the idea that you know, we have different gifts. So some have the ability, perhaps, the interest to teach. Others have the ability uh, to uh, see to those who are ill and who need help. Everybody has a different, you know, everybody's responsible for everything, but not everybody's good at everything. So 30-fold, 60-fold, that's, that's how that works. So the important thing is that unlike the other soils, there is a harvest and it is plentiful. All right, so let me just summarize this a little bit here. From this parable, we glean several more pieces of information for the puzzle. You know, we said we're, we're putting together a puzzle. What is the kingdom? So first of all, the kingdom is planted in the heart. This is where the growth and the perception of the kingdom is in a person's heart, his thoughts, his, her will, desire. Another piece, the kingdom is planted by the word of God, by means of the word. Again, why do we have Wednesday church? Why do we have Sunday night church? Why, why do we have Bible class? Uh, you know, why, not, why not just, everybody says communion is the most important thing. Why don't we just come at 11 o'clock, have a prayer, take communion, have a closing prayer and go home? You know, we'd we'll be doing the most important thing. Honoring Jesus, making a witness of our faith. Well, yeah, we would be doing that. And sometimes, isn't that what we do? Sometimes we're traveling or we're at work. You know, we, we just have time to take communion. But when we do that, what are we not doing? Well, we're not feeding on the word. The word is not being planted in us. So if the word is planted in us once a week through the sermon, well, that's good. But how about if the word is planted in us in the adult Bible class and then by, well that's even better in Sunday night and Wednesday and, you know, and my daily Bible reading. And, yeah, feed on the word. All, listen, whatever you sow into you, you will have a harvest. Look at it that way. Whatever you sow into you, that will produce a harvest eventually. Number three, the kingdom can be destroyed by total disbelief and rejection or by refusal to persevere with Jesus or by too great a concern over worldly matters and worldly riches. Like I said on Sunday, again, if you don't believe that, take a look around. You know, bring your old, bring your, if you've been here 10 years, bring your 10-year-old directory with you and go through the pictures. Yes, some brothers and sisters have passed on, yes, and some have moved somewhere, but a lot of those faces are still around, still alive, still live near the, quote, building, but they're not here anymore. So yes, the kingdom can be destroyed. Not the kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom inside of me can be destroyed. Number four, the kingdom grows at different rates in different people. Some mature quickly, 
and they bear much fruit. Others take a long time to grow. Others are slow in progressing, all of which alters their ability to give and serve and consequently uh, affects the maturity. If you only became a Christian when you were 57 years old, obviously, you, and you die when you're 70, well, you've had that much time to serve. Somebody else was baptized at camp when they were 12 and then never looked back. Well, that person has had a much longer time to serve. So obviously, yeah, he's going to have a greater, a greater harvest. In the end, there is always a harvest, however. And then number five, the kingdom can be missed. The kingdom can be missed. It can remain unseen by many people. When you try and try and explain and teach over and over again, don't feel bad if some people just don't get it or they don't want to get it. You know, don't beat yourself up over that. Don't blame yourself. Jesus said that three of the four soils would not have a harvest. <laughs> have you ever thought of that? People rejected Jesus, the one who spoke the parables and died for their sins, so don't be disappointed if certain ones do not hear and understand and respond to you, the sinner, because there's still hard and rocky and thorny soils that exist in abundance today. Feel guilty if you don't share the word with someone you know, that, that could use it, but if you've shared it and lived it and they still don't come around, that's on them. Not on you. All right, so some, some more ideas about the kingdom that we're putting together. We'll continue with these agriculture uh, type of parables in the next lesson.